Good afternoon, everybody. It's Patrick from the Poison Pan, and we're here with another of our virtual events today. And today we have a double header Poison Pen Press uh, event. Um, we're here with Jeffrey Seiger, and this is the paperback edition of his new book, A Deadly Twist. There is a special hardcover edition coming, and we will be getting hardcovers uh, fairly soon, I think. Um, and then this is uh, David Wagner's brand new book, To Die in Tuscany. Uh, these are really handsome covers. They're doing a nice job with these designs. Very cool. They are. And, Let uh, me add that the, Jeffrey is signing our hardcover copies of A Deadly Twist, um, but they're going to be delayed probably until May. There was a production issue. And I then see. they have to go to Jeffrey and they have to come to Scottsdale. And, you know, it takes a little while. I'll put a link though in the comments field for both of the books uh, for anybody watching if you'd like to order copies. And um, as usual, I'll be I'll be kind of behind the scenes here monitoring the comments um, off off screen. So if you have questions for David or Jeffrey, go ahead and put them in, and I'll I'll pop up towards the end of the program and ask some of those questions. So Barbara, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to see you both. Why don't we start out by, by reminding everybody that your first novel in your two series has been reissued with new covers and uh, some other in interesting stuff. Is there a reader's guide and an introduction? I think there's some new material. So David, your first book was a called Tuscan Stone. Right, Cold Tuscan Stone. So in this last one, we returned to uh, Tuscany to a certain extent. But yeah, Cold Tuscan Stone, it, did ha it does have a, an introduction by the author, me. Uh, and then uh, readers group guide questions. Uh, and then my usual, of course, uh, background on food and wine that I put in every book, thanks to your suggestion. Which makes them really fun. Now, I see, I think of David as not just a travel author, but really people who read cozies would love his books. They're not cute and they don't have talking cats or, you know, other things, but they, the crimes tend to be, shall I say, gentler, David, or mostly off screen. There's a lot of art history, um, architectural history, as well as glorious food and drink. Um, and so I think that a wide range of readers will really enjoy the Jeffrey's slightly harder. Jeffrey's a little bit tougher there with with the crimes, right? You have a, well, you are, but they're they're wonderful. And actually Mykonos, Mykonos is a place where the rich and often evil hang out. Um, you know, while it's not in every book, Jeffrey, it is in your first book, Murder in Mykonos. How long ago was it that we published that? My God, were they recording the, those days? Let me see, that was probably about 10 years, 11 years ago. Exactly. And when we got it, it was the number one bestseller in Greece um and remains i think most of your books if not all of your books have remained number one bestsellers in greece and part of their charm as with david's books is they take you to different parts of the country david tours you around italy and he was a foreign service officer there so he spent time there and really knows it and jeffrey jeffrey <laughs> jeffrey you just hung out in mykonos i don't think i can give you a dazzling profession you just you just like hanging out on the beach with all those women well, I, I have to say that I'll never have to ask myself the question if I would call and call his call and say, Jeffrey, don't you wish you had spent your better years of your life living on a Greek island? I'll never have to regret that question. That's no, my view. But it's true. You really, you really like that. So you have a long and intimate acquaintance with people in Mykonos. And of course, as we all know from crime conventions, people who hang out in bars tend to be very current in <laughs> all the gossip and crime. So a murder in Mykonos, um, that's when I first began to call you Cassandra, isn't it? Yes, it was. I, I preferred that name, other names I've been called, so thank you. And why is it that I call you Cassandra? Because for some strange reason, I happen to predict what's gonna happen, many times what's gonna happen in Greece years before it happened. Uh, I predicted the rise of a, the last prime minister years before he was elected. I predicted other things to have happened there. And uh, I, I don't know how I do it. I really don't. It's, as I said recently, it's sort of like I walk into a room and I see everybody having a shoe on their ear. And now I know that shoe doesn't belong there. So I say, that shoe doesn't belong there. They may add, I may not know where it's supposed to go, but I know it doesn't go there. And the people say, wow, what a genius. He knew we're not supposed to wear shoes on our ears. I mean, that's how I look upon how I come across these 
these things. And I, you were talking before about introductions to books. I was, I, I had the glorious pleasure of having uh, Tom Perry do the introduction to the reissue of Murder in Mykonos. And well, I, I get a smile. As Tom Perry was the very first person I ever did an event with. I did it courtesy of Barbara out there. And he was, he's just a great guy. But I remember we, uh, first thing we did was we went to a library and there were like three people there, including Tom and me. So it wasn't exactly a big one. He said, get used to it. This is what happens. And then we came back and did the performance at your place. And he was very generous. I, I start, he, he spoke first and I started to speak and he interrupted me and said, and I thought it was rather rude of him. He said, forget about it. I read his book. It's great. Read it. So I said nothing more to say. He's just a wonderful guy. So that's what launched my ability to tour is by meeting nice people. And I said, this is a great crowd to hang out with. And David, despite being with David, I agree with it yet. Actually, if I remember right, I sent you and Tom to the bar at the Hotel Valley Ho, where you stayed till like four in the morning. So a friendship was born at the Poison Pen. But um, the, thing about, the thing about Jeffrey's books that's interesting, one reason I call him Cassandra is not only does he predict things that are going to happen in Greece, but all of the books echo back to ancient themes in Greece. So Murder in Mykonos really has to do with religious mania. It's a serial killer novel, but you definitely, and it spends time in Mykonos, but then it floats whatever, like 40 yards offshore to Delos, um, which was, um, you know, a religious uh, center and so forth. So anyway, both these books are great. And both of them, uh, you can, if you've never read the series, you get an opportunity to hear from the author and have book discussions. And they're both suited, really brilliantly suited. The book discussions. So David, I'm trying to remember, is this book seven that we are doing now to die in Tuscany or is it book eight? It's book number seven. It uh, is, lucky seven, woo. And I'm glad I didn't uh, wear those shoes on my ears today. So I wouldn't look. <laughs> yes, book number seven. And we've gone back to Tuscany. And interestingly enough, there's a British author, I'm once again having a blank, um, who recently published a book in which the murder um, in England takes place in a botanical garden, which seems like a somewhat um, you know, unusual setting. But in To Die in Tuscany, again, a botanical garden features in your book. But, but you are in the hometown of Raphael the painter, right? Raffaello di Urbino. Yeah, Urbino is, is his hometown and his, uh, he is their most famous uh, native son, even though he spent most of his time in Rome and died in Rome and is buried in Rome, uh, much to the chagrin of the people of Urbino. But yeah, that's, that's where he was from. I remember when we, went, we were editing your book, you had some photographs and you sent me one of the, um, the street and the, and the house where, uh, where Raphael was born. So um, how did you come to spend time in Urbino yourself? Because um, when you write, I always feel that you've definitely spent time in the city that you're, that you're plunging your story into. Uh, it, it was one of those places that you kind of have to go to. It's a little bit off the beaten track. Um, it's kind of hard to get to, but it's well worth the effort. It sits up on top of a hill. And if I can work this right, uh, I might make a... Uh, virtual visit. Ooh. You know, let's see if I can go there. By golly, look at that. Look at how awesome. You should keep that behind you. It's better than your chair by a lot. Uh, yeah, it's much better. I wish I were there. But yeah, it's uh, it's one of those places you go to. The the uh, castle, which is right behind me here, making me look like Cornuda or something here, but uh, is now a museum. Uh, and a lot of the action takes place in that museum. So it's kind of a place if, if you get to Italy, you should really go to Urbino. It's really a nifty town. It's a university town too. So it's, it's got all sorts of great stuff. So it's a- Where, school... is, where is the botanical garden located? Uh, <laughs> kind Over of there? Our, fairly, yeah, everything. Yeah, I mean, it's Italy. It's kind of like Greece, I assume. Everything is close by in these towns. So you can walk to everything. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a saying in Italy, a misura di uomo, which means that a town is the measure of a man, meaning you can walk anywhere. And Urbino is certainly that way, although it's very hilly. So the, uh, the people that lived in Renaissance Urbino had good lakes. They 
Well, it's a fortunate thing for Rick Montoya, your protagonist, because since he eats and drinks a truly shameful amount in all of your books, you know, he's a runner. And fortunately, when he's in a landscape like Urbino, powering up and down the hills, he can kind of keep even, right? Right. And he does uh, run every morning uh, during this book, every morning of the, what is it, three or four days that the book takes place. My books always seem to be about three or four days. I guess maybe that's my attention span issue. But yeah, he does, he does make his usual morning runs. He does, but we'll come back to it because one of the interesting things about this book is that some of the players in it are not Italian, but um, are rather visiting. And also um, art is very, is very important in this book, but not the art of Raphael as it turns out. So we'll come back. So Jeffrey, um, A Deadly Twist, your new book, takes us to a really beautiful island. It's quite quite a neighbor of Mykonos, is it not, Naxos? Yes, it's very close. It's it's about an hour by boat. Uh, it's the largest and the greenest island in the Cyclades. And uh, that's that's the locale for it. And what what's happening now, you know, your guy, Andreas, who we first met in Murder in Mykonos, was there as the police chief, but subsequently he's moved to Athens and risen in rank, although, in one book, if I recall right, I'm trying to remember which one, he actually turns down a promotion because he doesn't really love the politics. And, um, but they're, they're very heavy in Greek policing as they are probably everywhere. Especially, policing's a tough subject to talk about right at the moment, now that I think about it. Yes, well, what, what is, uh, he was the uh, chief of police on Mykonos before he went back to Athens to take over his squad. And at one point as things evolved, he became essentially the minister, the secretary, depending on how you look at it, in charge of all police. He didn't like that position, so he gave it up in the next book. Besides, he could get more, he could be more involved as a cop. He can't really do much as a minister. Um, so that's where it was. Knoxville itself is a, is a fascinating place. Uh, my books, as you know, all focus on a significant issue confronting the contemporary world. And uh, in this case, you have Knoxville, which is a place which is uh, is naturally beautiful. It has endless beaches, beautiful mountains, reasonable, really warm people, reasonable prices. There's all the things that you want to find. And uh, it also has a group, uh, an active group of preservationists who are constantly trying to find the right balance with those seeking to expand tourism. Uh, it, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's obviously a lot of people interested and are hungry for a way to take advantage of Greece, of, of Noxus's natural beauty and its, the magic of its ways. So you have that, that yin and yang, which is an issue confronting virtually every tourist place on earth today. They all have to deal tourism versus maintaining the past. It was a natural for my book. That's why that was the issue I'm addressing. And it was a natural to do it. Because when I do the books, as you know, the primary goal I have is to entertain the reader. And Noxus gives a lot of chances to do that. It really does. I mean, you know, Greek has Greek a difficult contemporary history. I mean, economic problems, political problems, and so forth. And um, in this book, there's um, people in Noxos still have memories going all the way back to the Second World War because Greece was occupied. Um, I'm trying to remember, did it, was it the whole country, Jeffrey, or was it mostly? Um, Trying to remember Salonica. I know Salonica was a big issue because Philip Kerr wrote about it in one of his books. Well, Greece was occupied, but in some places it was mainly Italians occupying. But it, Greece was occupied. It was terribly devastated. I mean, Greece was the Greece was the country in which Churchill said, "Greeks don't fight like heroes. Heroes fight like Greeks." For the way they were able in 1940 to have kept the Germans from moving in. It was really the Italians kept. Sorry about that, but they kept them from being able to take over Greece and were supposed to be two weeks. It held them off, it required the Germans to come in, which affected their ability to invade Russia. Uh, it's, it's got off their scheduling. Uh, so the, the Greeks were devastated. They were really punished by the Germans for that, punished by it. And sadly, after the war was over, they didn't rebuild Greece, they rebuilt people who didn't side with it. And it was, it was something that took a hard time to come out of. Then you had the civil war between the loyalists and the communists in Greece that ran, ran for about four years. And um, it, 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 there's, a, there's a strong history there. And, there. and then there was a dictatorship 
uh, from 67 to 73, I think. Uh, so th there's a long history there of, of, of activity. Then you also had, you had violence. You had groups that were out there doing uh, assassinations and that. There's a lot there to work with. There's a lot there to work with. Yeah. Well, Greeks have long memories and many of them are very long lives. So, um, you know, we're kind of getting to the point where the few people who were active in the war are probably in their 90s, Lord, even older than I am. So <laughs> who could believe that? But um, it does give you a lot to work with. But let's go back. Let's go back to to Urbino. Um, David, you, um, although Raphael is the painter in question um, in terms of being the native son, in this book, some of the mystery revolves around a different artist. Who's that? One of my favorite Renaissance artists, Piero della Francesca, uh, who worked uh, mostly in Tuscany and has actually a couple of his more famous paintings are here in uh, behind me in the museum. Uh, but he was from San Sepulcro where the story starts because right. uh, a drawing which was a study for one of his paintings, which is actually in San Sepulcro. Um, it goes missing because it was going to be donated and it goes missing. And it turns out the donor uh, has been murdered and he was murdered up in Urbino, which is up the road from San Sepulcro. It's getting a little complicated here with these very places, but uh, most of the action takes place in Urbino. Well, but in several of your books, there's always a, a satellite, you know, city or something. Um, and in fact, in your in your next book, which um, which I think is wonderful, you you go to Assisi, but you also have um, a brief CERN and a brief moment in Palermo in Sicily. But then you have a side plot going on over in Pisa. So um, you know, sometimes you give us more than one destination to to enjoy while we're reading the book. Yeah, that's the case in this one. Um, even though most of the investigation takes place in Urbino, uh, Rick Montoya and his uh, trusty girlfriend, Benta, they have to go back down into a couple other little towns where there's a possibility of finding out who has the, uh, who has the missing drawing. So yeah, you move around. I mean, there's a lot to see in Italy. It's great. And, and even different. more food opportunities. So exactly. we should mention that um, Betta, Rick's girlfriend, fortunately works for the Italian art squad, the fraud squad. So that's very helpful when um, when we need a, a crime or we have an artistic background. But tell us a little bit about Rick because he's an unusual character since he's half from Santa Fe and, and half his family came from Rome. His mother's family is Italian. Mother's Italian. Uh, father is uh, an American diplomat. Write what you know, right? a diplomat from originally from New Mexico. Uh, so Rick has, uh, has relatives on both sides of the Atlantic and he works as an interpreter. His, his mother uh, made him bilingual and both, made sure he was bilingual in both English and Italian. So he's, uh, he works as an interpreter and uh, that's what gets him around to various towns around Italy. Uh, because he has to work and he works as a translator and people hire him in various towns very conveniently for the author here. Oh, uh, it is convenient indeed. And he has an uncle who's a high up policeman in Rome. So increasingly right. as Rick is wandering about to, you know, crimes occur and then either his uncle or the local police think that it would be helpful to have him translate because the, the, there's a need for people who don't speak, you know, to cover the people who don't speak Italian in the book. So in this case, it's people from Spain, right? If I remember right, it's been a little while since I've read it. This one's a, it's been a while since I've read it too, I guess. Uh, yeah, in this case, Betta invites him along, his girlfriend, because the guy who's gonna donate this painting and eventually ends up dead uh, is a Spaniard. So, uh, Rick also, he's actually trilingual uh, who's, because he's from New Mexico. You have to speak Spanish if you're from New Mexico, right? So uh, he ends up translating from uh, Italian to Spanish and Spanish to Italian in this case, uh, which is the first time that's happened in the book. It's kind of fun. 
Uh, it is fun. And actually in your, uh, in your next book, there's it's fun because a person from, from Santa Fe, a school friend of Rick's, comes into play. And that's the, well, you had a little bit of that in your book set in Rome, but I, I really enjoyed it moving forward, but he's an unusual character. So let's see, let's go back to Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, there, um, what, what's the status of journalists in Greece? I mean, they do some really great work, but are they often in danger if you're an investigative journalist? Does that put you in, uh, you know, the spotlight with some bad people? Um, you remember you called me Cassandra? I wrote about Nicoletta Urlia and the risk she had here. Three weeks ago, a key journalist was assassinated in Athens. One of the leading investigative journalists, a hit squad, no question about it. And they're not, they're not sure who did it, but he was investigating the quote, Greek mafia and some other things. So I guess the answer to your question, when you look at it currently, is yes, they are in drain, they are in trouble. Uh, that happened right after this. So <laughs> there's Cassandra. It is. So what happens in Noxos to kick off this particular mystery? Well, what happened is that that uh, Nicoletta uh, uh, Ilya is asked and is dispatched by her editor to investigate the simmering conflict between the, the, the advocates for, for greater tourism and the passion uh, uh, preservationists. And so she goes there and she meets a fan of her writing and she and who claims to be the underground internet's most successful black hat hacker. He takes credit for several suspicious deaths that Nicoletta had thought had reported on and thought were actually murdered. So he was essentially the murderer that she had thought he was. He swore that he'd given up his past and asked her to write an article on him so that the world will know that people like him are out there. Common, ordinary people who are paid to do horrible things as part of a calculated plan that is supposed to, at the end, show no guilt or no motive, no link back. Uh, she probably he asked her, he, he publishes that she pub excuse me, he published the article, and two days later her editor calls called us to say could you get someone out there to investigate her sudden disappearance, and also the discovery of a dead male body, at the bottom of a cliff, outside her hotel, which is why that cover has a cliff on. He sends he sent Johnny Corus over there, his assistant, and Johnny. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Yanni starts following leads and for certain he's turning up bodies. And that leads to Andreas coming over with his family and coming and his whole team getting to work over there. And as a result of the corruption and the difficult times that are going on, they end up in the path of a killer who's going to do anything, anything to keep certain secrets buried forever. I really like the fact that Giannis gets to have a lead role in the book because, you know, Andreas does have a squad um, and there are several people in it that we get to spend time with. And it's fun when one of them gets, um, you know, a greater share of the investigation and we spend time with them. Um, trying to think, was it in Sons of Sparta? Who was, which one was it in Sons of Sparta that wound up being basically the boots on the ground? That was, that also was Yanni. It was. was in, we know who's going to be in the next one, who gets the, the time in the sun uh, that, in that next book. But you're right. Each of these people, each of the characters, I think they have their own fan base. They really do. People like Yanni, people like Maggie, people like Andreas, people like Leva. I mean, so, and Tony, who is, uh, of course, his girlfriend. And they give, you a, they give you a range and a perspective of the way you address a problem because each one has their own strengths and weaknesses. And you can work that into the storyline. That's how I see it. Uh, and God willing, it'll be it works, it works very well. And um, since Andreas is married well, um, you know, he doesn't, he isn't subject to much in the way of economic pressure because his wife comes from a, a very rich and very prominent 
Greek family, which is how they get to live in this apartment within a view of the Acropolis, which I have to say, I, I wish it were real so that I could go and you know, cage a room for a night or two. But anyway, it does, it does leave him um, in a stronger position than a lot of people would be because he doesn't really suffer He's not worried about economic repercussions, um, so that you know that's always that's always helpful. Um, the only, sorry, sorry? The, the only one criticism I ever received on my book was by someone who said, "You make the cops too nice." Mm. That's the feeling, but I because he he he's right. He's insulated from that because he has that sort of a financial circumstance. That that does help him, and the apartment does exist. The friend has it. So I have a question for both of you, which is when you decide um, on a story, what do you do you think of the story and then find the location that fits or do you decide you want to write a particular location and then the story sort of evolves from that? What what happened in Urbino, David? What what is it that drew you there? Uh, I before I answer that, let me comment. The, I'm a big being a being a writer, the, the first chapter or so is so important. So when I read a book, uh, I see if how good the first chapter is. And with Jeff's new book, he really grabs you and draws you in immediately with, with the journalist and with the guy with the hacker and stuff. I mean, it's great. But anyway, to answer, to answer your question, I always start out with, a, with picking out the place uh, because in my books, probably like Jeff's, uh, the place where it takes it's like another character uh so it's kind of important then then after that i figure out well let's see what would be a good murder to go along with the place so uh maybe i'm doing it backwards than most people but that's always the way i've done it i don't think there's a right or wrong approach it's just um you know since it's so important to both your books where where in the country you decide to spend time your time and our time eventually that it makes sense to me that you might pick the place. But I also think there are stories that fit one place better than another. So, you know, Jeff, a couple of your of your stories really could only take place in a particular part of Greece. And so I'll, what's your answer to that? Do you, do you fit the story to the place or the other way around? Uh, what, what happened, well, it's hard to say that because the place, I like to write, I write about places I know. And so, Oftentimes the place will inspire me, and I'm not sure what the story is going to be yet, because I'm one of those see the pantser writers. I start to write, and I have no idea what it's going to be like. So I start in that area. Other times an idea hits me, and I follow the idea as opposed to the place, and they they sort of come together. But primarily, I would say I think of the place first because it's a place I know, and I can see how it can work. Um, and uh, it's a mutual admiration society with David. This is our third time we've done this gig together, by the way. Uh, I, I just, I just, it's so important to have the place be a character that people can feel as though not only are they getting to see it and being immersed in it, but they're being immersed in it as you would through the eyes of a local. That's key. This is not a, this is not a tour guide. This is your part of the countryside. That's the key to this as I see it. So whatever I'm writing, I have to feel that way. I just have to feel that way. That's interesting because David's next, next book um, actually has a tour group, an American tour group. Yeah, we, we see a CC through the eyes of the tour group, which I thought was really an interesting way to approach it, David. Yeah, that was fun. And that was fun. And it, it does draw in the, the, the whole Santa Fe, New Mexico thing in kind of a fun way. As Since you know New Mexico well yourself, uh, I assume you enjoyed that part. I did. No, it was it was great. And I think it's only fair that, that Rick's paternal half, you know, shows up in one of the stories because, you know, he's much more linked to his mother's family um, by being in Italy. So both of you really love surprises. I think that um, Jeff started out that way. But David, I think that you really have evolved into um, a tricky plotter. Um, and I, I do, you know, I mean, I remember we had a discussion about your second book where I thought that I had let you down because I didn't think that the plot was 
as it turned out, perhaps deep enough. And that, that, that was really on me, not you. Um, but as we've moved along, um, I think you've gotten to be extremely tricky. And in this book, um, I, I was truly surprised the way this plot progressed. I wish we could talk about it, but we can't, obviously. Um, but I like the fact that you brought in these characters from outside. And the other thing I really enjoyed was that you take us inside the museum. I mean, museumology is one of my particular passions. I never go anywhere without going to museums. And in this one, you really take us inside this major uh, museum in Urbino because this whole question of the painting, you know, is it authentic? Is it being donated and all the rest of it is so important in the book. Um, have you spent time in that museum? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great museum. I mean, it's huge. The castle, as you can see behind me, uh, is a huge castle. The museum is one small part of it, but still it's a, it's a huge museum. And it's got some great stuff in it. I mean, of course you can say that about any any museum. But it is a national museum. It's the it's the Museo Nazionale di Le Marche. So it's a nationally connected museum with the with the cultural ministry. Uh, you know, you mentioned that the Spanish connection. Um, this it was kind of a a, a work in honor of my mother. You noticed that my my mother was dedicated had the dedication in the beginning of the book, uh, and she was. Uh, half of my aunts and uncles are born in northern Spain, where this main character comes from. So that's why I worked a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in uh, in Asturias. Um, so that was kind of a you know a, a thing for me that uh, was you know it's almost emotional. My brother read the book and and he he said he got emotional when he saw the dedication to my mother. So that was kind of fun. Well, the Spanish. The Spanish family's dynamics are really interesting. And it was also interesting because Rick is, is the non-Italian in the books as a general rule. But in this book, um, in fact, it's the Spaniards who are also, we're seeing Italy and what's going on in part through their eyes. And so they too are outsiders. Um, and that, you know, that creates a, a different um, look. And Jeff, you brought some outsiders um, into your books as well. Sometimes really ugly heavies, um, but sometimes perfectly nice people. And in fact, you're very enamored with the American piano player um, who works in the bar on Mykonos and has become Yanis's girlfriend. And that character started out in a different book, didn't it? Because, um, um, right, we had that discussion and you brought her into this book and she, I think she fits beautifully there. I've written a standalone sort of, and, uh we decided not to do it. So I literally rewrote the book, but with this character because she appealed to me so much. And that book was Mekinos Mob. And, and, and it was natural for her to take a part in this next one because she would become a, a, involved with Yanni. Uh, and so she's also, she's a terrific character. She was also, her father was in the foreign service. So it was an homage to you, David. Uh, and he was, um, it was, she's quite a character. And I felt like I, I didn't have Americans in my book. So I figured I'd throw one in and see how she flew. She flew very well. She did very well. Am, am I remembering that uh, the Mykonos mob has been republished as Island of Secrets? The paperback version is Island of Secrets. Right, so, just for those of you watching who might be wondering where the Mykonos mob is, the answer is it's now called Island of Secrets. Yes. So you can enjoy it. Um, why don't we call Patrick up and see if he's got some questions or comments. He'll come back. Here he is. Um, indeed, I do. Let's see. Uh, okay. Well, you may have already talked about this, Jeff, but um, uh, David says, do you have your next book location scouted out yet? Uh, can you give us yeah. a hint? Is it okay, editor, to give it a, give it a hint? <laughs> Well, my ex editor, uh, to give hints, I would say yes, I have it. It's it's going to be in Icaria. Icaria is the island, also relatively close to Greece. It's in the northern Aegean, and it is known as the island where the people forgot to die, because there are one in three living to the nineties, and they're one of the five blue zones in this world, which means people there live for unexplained reasons far beyond that of the rest of the world, and they have many centenarians, people live over a hundred. 
And it seemed the proper time to write a book about age, considering what we've been through. So that's, yes. <laughs> That's I'm going to add that um, some years ago, I'm pretty sure it was in the New York Times magazine, but there was an article about Icaria and about, I think he was an American, a Greek American, who was diagnosed with cancer and decided, as he, I think he had no family or anyway, he went back to Icaria where he was from and settled into life there and miraculously began to thrive and eventually beat his cancer. Um, and um, there was a lot of comment about the lifestyle of the island where, you know, people just woke up when they felt like it, no alarm clocks, you know, they walked a lot. It's a very mountainous island. They, you know, real food all the time, no packaged food and whatever. And um, so that's a big question. There's so many centenarians on uh, any career, but the question is, you know, is it something in the genes or is it just that the lifestyle of the island, which is really kind of an old one, um, is helpful. So it was fun. It was fun to, you love the book. I thought it was terrific. And and maybe because because <laughs> we're both getting older, Jeff, maybe, <laughs> maybe that explains why Korea had such a hold. David, you will love it. <laughs> Rest of me. But on the other hand, the kind of food and drink that Rick indulges in, I'm not terribly sure he'd survive at Korea. <laughs> this is an impoverished island where people were for a hundred years, they lived in these rugged mountains. So the, so the pirates and the conquerors couldn't find them. Literally, it was a, it was a century of obscurity, they called it. They lived there. Because every time someone came from the sea, they just slaughtered them, stole them, or raped them. I mean, it was, it was, it was that was the country. It was considered one of the most um, uh, impoverished islands in Greece. And all that comes together. I don't, I'm, I, we got another book to talk about. We got to talk about this one. Right. <laughs> Well, you always have to leave readers. I like them all. In fact, what happens, I don't know if it happens to you, David, but having worked for, having written De Deadly Twist some time ago, and I then wrote, was immersed in this book. In fact, I've written another one as well. That when it came time to get ready for the book trust, I'm going to read a Deadly Twist because I'm going to get my plot lines all confused. Yeah. I've asked about it. So that's what happened. You always want to leave readers in expecting a new book and excited about it, which is, you know, just call it pre-marketing. All right, so Patrick, have a question? Yeah, um, let's see, our good friend, Lisa Holstein. She says, uh, hi, Patrick, would you ask Jeff to talk a little bit about his lovable villains? In several of his books, I've ended up rooting for the villain. <laughs> and, then, and then she says, the ending of A Deadly Twist is terrific and tell him I send love to his Barbara. I love you, Lisa. I don't know who I'm looking at on the screen here, but I love you too, wherever I see my eyes. I, I've got to tell you that um, I love villains. I really do. And um, it, I, it's really kind of someone, it's, it's Lisa say that. Uh, and I don't know, they just grow. They just grow. The, the one that comes to mind, first of all, is Teacher. Teacher was this woman from uh, a rather rough background. She appears in a couple of books. Um, and Another one is a fellow who was appeared in that as well. And um, Karen, his name is borrowed from the uh, ferryman who would take you from living to death. And each, every one of them just seems to have their own personality. And I like them. I really do. I, want, I actually want you to like my villains. I mean, I, you want them to have a dash of land, but I want you to like my villains. And if I could write a book just with villains, I might do that. Uh, but it's they're fun. They really are fun. Um, in this book, the villain is the villain is interesting. I, I approach it in a different level, a different way, because it, it, this book is all about things aren't what they appear to be. That's the whole point purpose of it. Things aren't what they appear to be, and um, we'll see how that how uh, how the next one does. Even Iceland has Iceland, excuse me, Icaria has uh, its own villain. Villains are important to me, and I'm glad that Lisa appreciates it. I'm gonna make I'm gonna call the next one maybe. Holstein. Yeah, that's a, I'll call him next one Holstein. <laughs> the next villain? Yeah. <laughs> As an homage. That'd be great. Well, that's nice. Thank you. You can name him Patrick Holstein. <laughs> that's a great name. <laughs> that's a great name. I'll, I'll do that. Patrick Holstein. That's really good. We'll see what he'll, what he'll do. All right. Patricios. Yeah, Patricios. No, I, this is a fit into another, the other book I wrote, which is not based in Greece so much. I don't find it, at least not yet it is. 
more it has a character which is more like a uh, George Smiley, Sherlock Holmes, The Equalizer. That, that character. That's, that's another. That's a fun thing. Meanwhile, I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. I'll go to my room. I've, I've put out a call for more questions, but um, have you have you already answered? Forgive me if you've already answered this question, Jeff. But when did you first go to Greece? About 35 years ago, a little more than 35 years ago. Um, what took you there? Uh, a friend of mine. She said we'd love it. We love it over there. I did love it over there. In fact, when I got off the plane, I felt, my God, I'm home again. I really did. And the first day we were in Mykonos, I walked past a jewelry store and a guy invited us in. I figured he was in a house to buy jewelry. And so happened, he just was being nice. He was a very smart guy, Mark market and all that. And he, uh, we became like best friends. And he happened to be the, the most respected guy in the island. I didn't know it. We became really good buddies. And in fact, he passed away. And Tassos, in my books, is an homage to him. This is the name of Tassos. The Mullis, the book is Stamatos, but it was that. So I became part of the family. I felt like I was like, from the first day I was there, I was part of the island. It was a real, real lucky thing. The fates took me there. David, how long were you in Italy with the Foreign Service? Because obviously you were in several. Yeah, we had we had three assignments, total of nine years. Uh, three years in uh, Milan and then two different times in Rome uh, for a total of nine years, almost 10. Anyway, you know, it's, it's kind of like what Jeff said. In Italy, it's the same thing. It changes your life. I mean, you, if you live in a place like that, you look at everything differently. You look at food differently. You look at sort of this lifestyle differently. You obviously look at artists. You look at history differently because they got real history there. Uh, and I, that's why I love to fold all of those kind of things into my books because... Uh, that's that's how you're changed when you live in a place like that. Have you watched Stanley Tucci's series about eating around Italy? It's really fun. I've I've watched uh, mm -hmm. Naples, the first one in Rome, and then I got sidetracked by other things. But I'm going to go back to it. But he really die, takes a deep dive, doesn't he, into the local cuisine? I, I wasn't sure what to what to expect, but he 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 does a great job. It's uh, it's good, and he gets into gets into a couple of restaurants that I know. And of course he eats a lot of food that I know. Uh, and I think, and I forget which one it was. I think it was the Milan one. He eats pizzoccheri, which is in, the, in my second book. It ends with them eating pizzoccheri, which is this uh, special kind of pasta. No, he's, it's a great, it's a great series. And there's going to be more, I think, right? I think so. And he's one of those really annoying people who's tall and thin and appears to have a metabolism that works 14 times faster than real people so he can actually eat his way through Italy without gaining an ounce whereas if it were I I would suddenly have looked you know well it just it's very frustrating but uh, yeah I think he's terrific he has a great presence he was in wasn't he Julia Child's husband um in um I'm, I'm sure he was um, a really good movie about Julia Child Oh, you mean the actress? You mean in yeah. the movie? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, he played Julia Child's husband in whatever the film was, and that's actually one of the first times I saw him, and I thought he was great. And that was all about food too, or at least a huge amount of it was about food, but French food. And um, Patrick, you're you're not pulling out your phone to you know help me out here because you're so good at it when I go blank on stuff like that. What is it now? You're looking for the actor who played Julia Child's yeah. husband. Right, Stanley oh. Tucci was cast in oh. the movie and um, it was really a good movie, but that uh, again, very much centered on, well, I'll tell you what, you ask a question, I'll look it up on my phone for a change. We'll just swap roles here. Okay. Um, Jeff, have it, forgive me again, if, if you've already discussed this and I missed it, have any of your books dealt with, um, kind of hearkened back to a story dealing with uh, Greece during World War II? And what was going on in, in the islands? It seems like it was kind of a tricky, because there's so many islands. Is there any case actually, that deals with it? I actually thought of doing a book based on that, and Philip Kirk did his. And uh, another time I someone else did, and I said, I'll let it slide. Oh, the islands were deeply affected by it. People starved and died, and they had to repopulate them in some cases. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a very difficult time. And it's strange because I sort of, it lets me understand a lot. Well, 
we talk about the tourism. How Mykonos today is like the playground for the rich and famous. I mean, it's amazing. Just it was the poorest place in the in Greece in the World War II. They came out of. They suffered. They died. And that generation, the children of that generation as well, they have seen this transition to go from utter poverty to the point where it is now billionaire row. And I don't really grudge them anything they're doing because they went through it. They're entitled to live that life as they do. Uh, it can, and it'll be interesting to see how the next generation does, thinking this is what it's always like. But um, it, they, it's been, it's been amazing the, the sudden change from the end of World War II to to now it really has been for them. And by the way, a plug for this gentleman. Well, I guess David. I'll just say because I don't know where you appear in my finger point. Um, if I'm not, if I'm not in Greece, I'm in Italy. I'm 100 percent with him. It's just wonderful. In fact, the last place we were before the world shut down was Tuscany. We were in Chitona, but uh, it's really a great place. Really love it there. So I've done my magic on Google. The film was Julie and Julia, and in that film, he. Um, he played Julia Child's husband. And the current thing that we're talking about is Stanley Tucci in Italy. And each one of them is like David's books. He goes to a particular location and then he, he eats and drinks. Um, anyway, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun for those of you not traveling at the moment. And Julia and Julia, Julie and Julia was a, an interesting movie because it, it was about Julia Child and then a woman aspiring to be a chef. Um, but Stanley Tucci, I thought, was the high point of that, even though I think Merle Street played Julia Child, if I remember right. Right, right. right. Yeah. Anyway, it was great. So Patrick and I have a thing going. When I can't remember anything, he uses the chat function to, to remind me because, as we all know, our memory is not what it was, right? So <laughs> kind of hard to do that. Anything else in the way of questions, Patrick? Um, there, well, I mean, Diane DiBiase says hi. I'm not sure if she's still watching, but uh, let's see, any specific questions? They're notably silent. I think they're just enjoying the presentation. Oh, um, I was gonna ask, I was gonna ask a little bit about uh, Michael Dibden, um, you know, love his books. And David, did you, was he a source of inspiration for you at all? Absolutely. Yeah, he's, he's the great. Whenever people ask me what other, what other books based in Italy, crime books should I should read, I always mention Dibden first, and then Don Leon, and then Andrea Camilleri. Mm -hmm. But going back to your question about World War II, and, and, and I think it's my third book, uh, the, the thing of the partisans comes in, you know, former partisan, or partigiano as they call him. Uh, is worked into the plot. And that was one of the things I found fascinating when I got to Italy. I think I was in Milan for a year before I met somebody who actually admitted that he was a fascist. Because it seemed like, it seemed like you, most of the pop, probably get the same thing in Greece. From that, you'd think, well, the whole population was up in the, up in the hills fighting, fighting its partisans. Uh, which I always found kind of interesting. Everybody claimed to be a partisan and never, you know, in the fascist party. But anyway, I- True in, true in France where they all belong to the resistance, you know, um, there's a lot of rewritten history once the war, the war is over, for sure. There, those heroes fighting like Greeks I mentioned before, there was a problem in Greece after the war, there was a concern on the parts of the powers that Greece would go communist. So the partisans would fought the hardest I'm going to get smacked by some Greeks for saying this. Were said to be the part. Were said to be the communists. They were organized a really fight, and uh, they were they were not followed up and treated the way they thought they should have been treated after the after the war was led to the civil war. It came after that. It was. Um, but the bottom line to your question only to me is I've not written about that per se. And so I one of the big takeaways from this whole conversation is you can see how much fun these two authors have had writing their books. A chance to, uh, in David's case, revisit Italy. Uh, how long has it been since you've been back to Italy, David? Has it been a while? Yeah, it's been years. It's been years, even before the uh, before the pandemic. You know, unfortunately, to get to Italy, you have to get on an airplane, as you mentioned earlier. Before actually, before we went on, we we're talking, uh, and uh, it's no fun to get on an airplane. So I haven't been back now. It's been a while. 
So for you, it's revisiting and having a wonderful time. And for Jeff, who's hoping to go back to Greece um, this summer, um, you know, you're still experiencing it. But both of them, it's interesting, both of them are relatively small countries, but, um, but so rich, not just in history and food and all the rest of it, but um, the little individual regions of these countries are so distinctive. You know, I mean, it's all Italy, but Tuscany and Umbria and, you know, Sicily and all are really different. Um, and the same is true in Greece with the different locations that Jeff writes about. Um, yeah, thanks, same right. So, you know, it's fascinating to have a chance to go in depth into these countries. So, you know, you can read the books for enjoyment, but they're also a great preparation for, you know, in the after times, which we hope are coming, um, that you can go and travel there. Yeah, the great, that's one of the great things that I always tell people about Italy is, is the regionalism. Yeah. Every, every region is different. And within the regions, they are small and they, and they don't like each other within the same region. Uh, there's, a, there's a term in Italy called campanilismo, which means a campanile being the bell tower. And you, you had loyalty to the, to the town with, within, the, within the sound of the bell that you heard. So everybody is, you know, very tightly connected with their town. And when you, but when you get a few miles away, a few kilometers away, well, those are those guys. But it makes it fascinating. It does. Is there a, is there a strange place where you can actually hear both competing bells? <laughs> Good point. At the Good same point. time. Probably. You know, you know, the problem is that most most tourists are whipped through all these spots. You know, you go from one to the other with the speed of light and you hit the highlights. I mean, I was 15 when I first went to Italy. And I remember, you know, it's like two nights in Rome and one night in Assisi and a nod to Perugia and on you go. Um, and you really do need to spend time. You know, if you can plan it, it's better to spend um, several days in one place and then several days in another, but often that's hard to do. So these books give you a great opportunity to do that. So guys, it was wonderful to visit with you. Thanks so much for your time. And um, I guess we'll be looking for a new book from each of you in 2022, right? Meantime, to die in Tuscany in a deadly twist. And if you've never read any oh. authors, pick up a cold Tuscan scone, <laughs> scone, a cold Tuscan stone by David and read the introduction and so forth. And then read Murder in Mykonos by Jeff. And lucky you, you will have seven books by David and 10 books by Jeffrey to enjoy, which is a wonderful way to spend some time while we're all shut up at home. So thanks guys, it was really a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you David, good to see you again. Have a wonderful weekend. And thank you all for spending time with us this afternoon. Bye. <laughs>